Um, we are, oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. What a beautiful day God has given us for fathers, huh? Um, we are going to continue with our, oh, next week, I'm sorry, the first weekend in July, we're going to be having the 9 to 12 year old class back started again. So, um, sorry 9 to 12 year olds, you're stuck with me for another couple weeks, but if you get into July, we'll get a teacher for you, okay? So, we are continuing with our testify. And today I've asked Steve Monell if he would be willing to give up and share his testimony. So, Steve. I don't know how willing I was, but I... <laughs> I'm not very good at this, and it won't get any better by the time I'm done. So, here it is. <laughs> so, anyhow. Um, uh, most of you know me. If you don't, uh, my name is Steve Monell. Uh, my wife Angie and my sons Nathan and Luca uh, live here. Lived here for 15 years. <laughs> Memory doesn't take me more either. But uh, um, anyhow, we've, we've been uh, coming to Jesus Community Church for 15 years, I guess, and most of that time been uh, leading praise and worship and uh, seen a lot uh, come and go over the years, and we're really blessed with. Uh, um, just what we have um, in the confines of this congregation of, of people that we can draw on to um, <clears throat> to uh, share with us uh, those uh, duties of leading uh, you guys um, in praise and adoration of our, our King. Um, so enough said about that. Um, I was born and raised in central Nebraska, uh, good place to be from, and uh, was, uh, I grew up on a Little bitty ranch, small compared to most places, but it was, uh, it was a good place for me to grow up on. I loved the outdoors and spent as much of my time outdoors as I could. I was the sixth of six kids, so I was last, and uh, was probably a little bit spoiled, but it wasn't my fault. <laughs> that I have of anything religious or churchy or anything like that was, was attending church. I attended for the first several years of my life was a little uh, Sunday school, which was uh, at that time was called an American Sunday School, Sunday school Union, later changed to American Missionary Fellowship. Um, had to do with uh, going around rural uh, communities and setting up um, Sunday schools where um, there just wasn't anything, and, and there were several of those types of Sunday schools in that region of Nebraska that I grew up, and along with a, a few Bible camps that they would set up uh, for uh, uh, kids to go to during the summer. And um, so, yeah, I, I uh, went to uh, went to that little Sunday school, and um, I guess I was probably about five five years old when I uh, remember, sort of remember memory gets sort of vague back in those days, but I um, remember my mom taking me outside after the service uh, to the car and she led me in a little prayer of salvation and um, that was my technical uh, day of salvation. Um, I don't know, I was five years old and I think if you've read the little note on the church webpage, um, I don't know that I really wanted to trust the most important decision I would ever make. Uh, on a memory, you know, that, that goes back that far, and um, so, um, you know, the later time in my life, I, I made sure of that decision, and uh, just really wanted to know that, that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and uh, so I, I, I guess if you want to call it a recommitment or a assurance or whatever, I, I did that, and um, I just know that He's my Lord and Savior. Um, had a lot of high and low points growing up in my life. Like I uh, said earlier, growing up on the, the, the little place we grew up on was, was just a lot of fun. I just enjoyed all this work, you know, out in the hay field, working with cows and pigs and that sort of thing. But, but it was still good. It was good. Um, I, I feel very blessed. Um, we didn't have a lot, but 
you know, we, we had what we did have. Um, you know, the, I mentioned Bible camp, you know, every summer since I was probably eight years old, I had gone to, to uh, Bible camp for a week and, and you know, just learned a lot of God's Word, met good friends, made fellowships, social development, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so those, those were good things. Probably the lowest point in my life up to that time, um, the summer I was 13 years old, I lost my mom. Um, she had uh, died due to complications from Addison's disease, and uh, so that was a hard blow on me. Um, but being a kid, I think you bounce back from that stuff maybe a little more than you normally would as an adult, or I don't know, maybe you don't, but I guess I never let that really affect me because I knew where mom was. She was with, with our Lord, and uh, so, I, you know, yeah, it was, wasn't easy, but it was... Uh, uh, but it wasn't that bad because I knew where she was. Uh, so, and at the same time, previous, my dad had uh, suffered uh, for a couple of years prior to that uh, from dementia, and so he was uh, had to be placed in a veteran's home and uh, had uh, pretty much kind of lost contact with him. Um, and uh, there was uh, there some really blows there. Um, even before his dementia, he was. Uh, was, had spent most of his life not uh, being a Christian, not wanting to follow God, and, and that showed in his uh, relationship with his family, with his wife and kids, and his uh, relatives, and just basically anybody that knew him. Um, but he, he did, uh, I believe, later in his life, um, he did accept Jesus as a Savior. He, he claimed that, and um, I don't know, I guess once a disease like dementia sets in, Maybe it's not that easy to tell, but one thing I know that uh, seemed to change in him was I, I do remember him uh, sitting by himself reading the Bible and writing down passages. And, and you know, I, I don't know how much dementia played in that, but I, I believe it was a real thing. Our, our pastor at the time, I believe, led him to the Lord. And I think I'll see him again someday. Uh, he passed away a few years later. But, uh, so, you know, I, I guess I have that hope, and, you know, I don't know for certain that I'll see my dad again until I step, you know, across that threshold of death, but, but I, I think I will. So, you know, the, the, the hard times of that are sort of washed away by the, I guess, the passage of time and just by, um, you know, the knowledge that I, I, I really have that hope that, that, you know, lost people don't have. Um, so having lost my parents at that age, uh, basically 13, um, I uh, went ahead and finished out my uh, junior high school at the public school, and uh, then it was decided that it would be best for me to go to Christian high school for my uh, nine through uh, uh, senior years, which I did, um, and it was good. It was a good thing for me. I, I probably uh, received a lot of benefit from that. Again, studying the Bible, having Bible classes, uh, fellowshipping with Christian kids my age, and uh, having Christian teachers that could actually um, sort of care about you and uh, really, you know, uh, pray for you. They, you know, get together in their teachers' meetings and they pray over all the kids. And uh, you know, found that out later, but I thought back, that was pretty cool. You know, the teachers that actually, you know, love you and care about you and, and want the best for you. And, you know, it helped me with um, what I do, too, as far as the music. I'm, I'm you know, a great talent when it comes to music, but I, I do what I do, and God put those opportunities in front of me to sing and, and be involved in uh, choir and a little small group and that sort of thing. So, so that helped me out a lot. And, uh, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a, a blessing, kind of wasn't really expected, but, but I think God used that in my life to mature me. And uh, I still had... Uh, so I had a lot of feelings of alienation. That was that was really hard, though. Even in that environment, where you know the friends I had at school that I made and the teachers, I still felt alienated. It's like you know everybody else. You know, you either meet their parents or you hear about their parents, and I'm kind of like the thumb sticking out. And like, who's this guy? And uh, um, so I felt different and I felt alienated. I'm kind of angry, I guess. And I don't know. Where my anger was directed, if it was at God, I, I suppose it was, maybe at my parents, I, I, I'm not really sure. Um, but I, I struggled with that, and I was, was fairly introverted, um, and uh, I got out of school, went to college, 
and uh, um, moved on with my life and just kind of doing, I guess, whatever. I mean, I was a Christian, but I guess it was like, you know, I'm off with God. And I just kind of just kind of became a little more selfish and just self self uh, introverted. And, um, but I moved to Colorado and, uh, in uh, the late 80s. And uh, one of the things that really helped me over there was uh, I, I started going to a few Christian concerts that they would have in the area. And they had some pretty good ones. And one of the best ones I ever went to was a David Meese concert. And uh, David Meese had... Uh, uh, and shared his testimony of his father, and, and his father, uh, if I understand right, was fairly abusive of a man. And uh, that evening, as he shared his testimony, he, uh, you know, he said he had to come to the point where he could forgive his dad. And I guess that was a, a big changing point in my life, because I, I guess I, I didn't have any forgiveness for my father. Um, I guess I sort of blamed him more than anybody else, I guess, for maybe some of the, the woes and troubles growing up and that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, some of it might be so, some of it probably misplaced. But nevertheless, he, he gave his testimony and uh, I was like, wow, I just I just felt God moving in me. It's like, you know, you, you need to do that with your father because he's just a man. He was only a man and uh, he had his failures and, you know, he had his issues growing up, a few of which I know, um, which I won't go into. Um, but, but he had a, a pretty hard life himself, and he just did, was not a relational person. And, uh, but, kind of funny to be talking about, about, about that on Father's Day. <laughs> just um, but anyhow, um, so, you know, I did, and I was able to forgive him. And uh, even though he'd been, had been dead for a couple, three or four years, um, he was gone. But I was able to forgive him, and um, I learned a lot there. And uh, it didn't mean I became perfect overnight, but, but I think God changed me during that time and began to change me as I let that anger and frustration and feelings go. Um, he, uh, he started to change me and work on me, and then he's been doing that ever since. And, um, and you know, as I've moved on with my life, and uh, you know, over the next few years I got married, we moved up here, started having our kids, and. Uh, started delving into what life is, and uh, you know, God's God's been really good. And, and I would say, you know, in my prayer, I had kind of mentioned the the thing about you know reading God's word and praying. And, and I, I suppose, that, you know, if I would confess before you today, probably my biggest fault um, would be probably my lack of that over over the course of my life. Um, and um, some days I get rather discouraged over that because I look back and, you know, Steve, you've, you've done a lot of things and a lot of them are just a waste of time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, just, I can't encourage you guys enough. And it doesn't matter whether you're sitting here and you're 10 years old or you're well into your 60s or whatever. Um, it's not too late. As long as you're drawing your breath and as long as you have a relationship with God, I cannot stress enough um, Get into God's Word. If you are, good. If you're not, do it. Um, I, I, that's, that's one of my biggest regrets, I guess. It's not spending the quality, quantity of time in God's Word that I should have over the years. And, and that's changed, and I've done so much better. But it's just, um, and you know, it's like, oh, it's, life's too busy. I've got to get up too early to go to work, or, you know, I've been working all day or whatever. Make that time. Please make that time. You won't regret it. Um, I just, you know, have just, when I delve into God's Word, it helps me. It helps me with the issues that I deal with every day. It helps me, you know, in, in the battle. You know, you put on the full armor of God. And, you know, His Spirit will bring scriptures to mind. When you're battling some issue, some sin, some problem in your life, He, he is faithful. God says He's faithful. And he is faithful. He will... He, will, he has given us everything we need to live a godly life. And we need to, I guess, step up to the plate, if you will, and, and take advantage, if you will, of those things. And, and that's how we take advantage of that, is, is get into His Word and, and pray and, and just, just get to know our Creator. We're going to be with Him for eternity. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're going to be with Him for eternity. You really want that? I do. And a, a better way, I mean, He's given us this opportunity to live this life and to get to know Him and... and 
Um, I just want to leave with a, a couple of scriptures out of Hebrews that I really like. And uh, Hebrews 10, um, verse 11 starts out, says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But he, speaking of Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And I just think it's very precious we, we have that promise. And those words full of promises. So, you know, thank you. Thank you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for testimony. Father, that we have brothers and sisters that can share into our lives what you have done in theirs. Bless you for this, Father. Uh, another way that you have implemented to strengthen your, your body, to encourage us. And I, I thank you, Father, for the testimonies that have been shared over the last few weeks. I thank you for Steve's as he shared today. And we bless your name for the miracle of salvation you've given us. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> So, um, you know, it wasn't until Wednesday that I realized today was Father's Day. <laughs> so I'm plugging along, working on Colossians, and, and uh, Christy said, so are you doing a special message for Father's Day? <laughs> Think about that when we get there. <laughs> oh, we're there. <laughs> and so... Uh, Massive change of direction on Wednesday, and and I've actually been reading quite a bit. And I want to share with you um, an article that I read. I actually read it last night, and I thought, how cool, because this is directly in line with what I want to share with you today. Now, this is what this came off of Fox News. Um, it was in the opinion section, and so um, the author is uh, Suzanne Banker. And this is part of what she has to say. I'll leave the article over there if you want to read it later. Um, she said, Father's Day 2013 arrives on Sunday. Here's what we have to show for it. According to a survey conducted by today's moms, more than half of the 7,000 mothers polled feel more stressed out by their husbands than they do by their kids. Imagine if the Today Show had polled men instead and the response was the same. More than half of all husbands feel more stressed out by their wives than they do by their kids. That would never happen. Not because it's never true, but because men don't tend to point fingers, particularly at their wives. When pressed, however, they will tell you what they want. In a 2012 Today Show survey of 1,500 dads, two-thirds of the respondents said what they want most from their partner is a little verbal acknowledgement. In other words, respect. Going on, um, She is quoting, um, this is a, a psychiatrist, says, men know women are powerful, and we don't mind that one bit. It empowers us that you're empowered, unless, that is, you disempower us in order to feel empowered. So further down, she says, so this Father's Day, let's give men what they want, respect. Instead of complaining about husbands, about what husbands and fathers don't do, Let's honor them for what they do do. I want to share with you just some statistics about fathers. And I don't know I'm going to share these are just, just statistics. This came from the uh, um, Wayne Parker who wrote The Fatherhood Guide. Okay, these are statistics that he's pulled from a bunch of different resources. Uh, fatherless homes, okay? These are the statistics for fatherless homes, okay? In fatherless homes, the children are two times more likely 
to end up in jail. Twice as likely. Okay? 63% of suicides come from fatherless homes. 63%. 85% of behavioral disorders, again, fatherless homes. 85%. 71% of high school dropouts from fatherless homes. 70% of the kids in juvenile detention are from fatherless homes. Conversely, I want to share a statistic with you. And my numbers are, are a little bit, they might be a little bit off because I'm going from memory. Uh, but they did a statistic on the number of kids that continue in church after they move out of their family's homes. Okay? And the number of children that continue in church after they move out of their homes, when they were attending church, they had both parents attending. Okay? 62%. Okay? So both parents attend church as the child's growing up. 62% of them continue going to church. Good, but I think we can do better. I think we have to do better. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because single parent homes or, or single parent attendees, let's just leave it at attendees, okay? If the mom was the one bringing the children to church, much like my childhood, okay, that number drops to about 54%, okay? If mom is the one bringing the child to church, the number drops to about 54%. If the father is the one that brings the child to church, that number jumps to 78%. Now this week, as I was pondering this, I was thinking about, uh, I just had some questions I'm going to share with you. Why did God, in His infinite wisdom, why did He orchestrate the family the way that He did? Why did He require a man and a woman to be together to make a child. Why couldn't it be like worms? Divide and multiply. You know? Um, you know, I, I, why? I know, nobody else thinks weird things like that. Okay, but I'm just sharing you the convoluted turnings of my mind, okay? Okay? Why did God create them in such a way that they were completely dependent So you like that one? A loaf of bread, walking out. <laughs> Completely dependent on somebody to take care of them. <laughs> why did God not create children, knowing everything they needed to know? I mean, why did he wait till they were teenagers? <laughs> Why did he not create them able to do everything they needed to do? Why were they so dependent? And why <coughs> did he require two parents to make it work? And in, in pondering this, I came across a number of ideas, a number of thoughts, and I'm, I'm going to share with them with you. Because see, my belief is that the dynamic that God has put in place, remember when God created Adam? And he looked at him and said, it's not good for him to be alone. You know, the little chimpanzee wasn't helping up. You know, the water collie didn't quite cut it. He said, I'm going to give him what? A helper. A helper. And he created woman. Okay? Now, I don't believe it was ever God's intent for man to be alone. I don't think God, I actually heard... A message by a pastor that if I said the name you would prob probably all recognize. I think it's garbage. And this pastor said, oh, you know, when Adam was originally created, he was designed and intended to deliver babies. Garbage. Because that means God was not prepared. That God made a mistake. I don't think man being created first was God going... Something's wrong with this picture. What do we need to do to fix this? You see, that denies God's omniscience. Right? 
I mean, if God knows everything at all times, didn't he know that at the beginning that when Adam was created, there was going to be a need for Eve? Do we really think that little of God that he out there, uh, you know, well, uh, I, no, I think I'll create something today. Oh, darn, I better fix this. Come on. Garbage. I think God intended first for man to be by himself so that man would recognize and appreciate his need for woman. Okay? God created woman to be a help, an asset to man. The two of them coming together to make a child. Now, when the two of them come together to make a child, today's culture tells us, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Down the road they go. And we have about, depending on which statistic you look at, I looked at everything from 32% all the way up to 54% of homes in America today are living with mom as the only parent at home. Okay, that's not counting blended families where mom and dad are now with stepmom and stepdad, or or maybe step step mom and stepdad or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I, I I had to I don't know. I think I, I deal a lot in ignorance. I understand things are bad, but in the walls of my house, things aren't like that. But I had the misfortune to to sub for a class last year, and and it was uh, the end of the year, and the kids were just kind of goofing around, They'd all, they were in the middle of taking finals and, and uh, they were supposed to be studying. I don't care if you flunk. You can take the class next year. But I was in a study hall and they were talking about, you know, who was related to who. Now, I, for those of you that don't know, I was at Corvallis. Okay, and who's related to who becomes a very convoluted thing when you have a lot of kids from Pinesdale. Okay, there's like 78 Jessups in the Corvallis High School. I'm not kidding. There's probably 70-some Jessups in the Corvallis High School. And they're all related. Some of them by having the same father and different mothers living in the same home. Okay? But this was not one of those. Okay? This was a young lady who was not a Pinesdale person. And she was trying to diagram for us her, her brothers and sisters and steps and halves. And, I, and I, quite honestly, I, I got totally befuddled because she had mom and dad Okay, and the two, her and her brother. Then they got divorced, and mom remarried a man with a couple of children, and so now they also have a child that's a half of them, but also steps. And then dad remarried, and he had a couple that are halves, and then they divorced, and he remarried another person. So you've got this whole row of rainbow colors trying to figure out how this family dynamic works. Okay, we're not addressing that today. Okay, just throw that out. That was a freebie. Okay? But I want to share something with you. I want, to, I want to share with you an interesting dynamic. I started off talking about the, the article on, on the women's movement. Okay? Now, I don't want women. Do not get me wrong. I am all for the equality in America. Okay? But... I want to share just an interesting insight I had while I was studying. Back in the 60s, we started pushing for women's rights. Great. Awesome. Back in the 60s, we also started seeing men going from dignified positions. Uh, let's just talk about television. Look at the sitcoms before the, the 60s. You know, Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver. You have situations where fathers are respected people, all right? And then jump ahead and, and you start seeing the change where you end up with everybody loves Raymond. Now everybody loves Raymond because the dude's an idiot and he can't do anything right. Thank God he's got a wife that can hold his life together, okay? And all of a sudden we see this gradual diminishment of the value of being a man, of being a father, of being a husband. So at the same time that we see the rise in the value of women, we see the decrease in the value of being a man. In that same time period, we see divorce rates skyrocketing. You know, uh, Mild estimates put it at 
One out of every two marriages is going to end in divorce. I've seen some estimates as high as 72%. That's scary. Yeah, what's even scarier is the number is not any different inside the church than outside the church. Okay, so we see the value of man being diminished. We see the fracture of the nuclear family, the way the family was designed to exist. And we see all these abortive, disgusting attempts to re-justify, to, to redefine what a family is in order to accommodate how we want to be. Okay, now first, everybody jumps right to homosexuality. Okay, and yes, that's, that's a, one of one. But how about just the mixed families? Why all of a sudden is it okay to divorce and remarry and divorce and remarry and divorce and remarry? When did the church lose sight of the fact that God despises divorce. I hate it. Oh, God understands. He's good. He's loving. He wants me to be happy. Bull. He wants you to be holy. And it's only when we understand that by giving up the rights to ourselves that we can really have joy. Okay? That's the way the dynamic works. All right? When I am out there pursuing my goals, my agendas, uh, you know, if my life is all about me, how do you suppose my wife is? Christy, would you like to share? Not married. Not married. <laughs> if my life is all about me, my goals, my agendas, my hobbies, my interests, how happy do you suppose my children will be? Mackenzie? Not very. Not very. Okay. See, it's by giving up what we are that we actually attain something better. There is an assault on fathers in America today. Okay. This is not just a passing fancy. It's not a phase. It is an assault on men. Now, Christy and I teach the Love and Respect class. I wanted to share with you some of the things from the Love and Respect class. Women, do you want to be loved? Yeah. Now, you were designed that way. God put that little thing in you, that little cute heart and the beating and the frills, because that's the nature that God has placed in you. You desire to be loved. Okay? When surveyed, they ask men, which would you choose? Now, I can't remember exactly. I, I lost how I just lost. If you, to be respected and unloved, or to be loved and disrespected, which would you choose? Uh, you're in the 22%. 78% of men said they would rather be respected and unloved. Because, see, that's the niche that God has put in us. To be respected. Now, wives and children, I'm talking to you today. Because, see, when a man goes to work, he's no kind of man unless he receives respect there. He won't stay at a job very long if the people don't respect him there. But I've seen situation after situation after situation where a man comes home from work where he is honored and held in esteem and, and congratulated for his work ethic, his honesty, his integrity for being there, taking one for the team. And he comes home and, where have you been all day? I've had a hard day. I need you to take care of the kids. Now, I'm not saying this is all you wives. It's none of the wives in here. <laughs> <laughs> all right? This is the, the other. <laughs> All right? That's not true. It's probably all of you at some point. <laughs> okay? And, and we're, we're going to bash men later. But today's Father's Day, so no bashing of the men today. <laughs> but I want to I share with you some things, women. See, God has written in His Word instructions for how men and women should relate to each other. Okay? And... 
flip open with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Because we're going to read a couple of things now. Okay, now, before we read this, do you guys understand, does everybody agree that this is the Word of God? Yeah. Yeah. This is God's Word to us. Specifically, God's Word to me, meaning if you're reading the Word, it's to you. Okay? So this is God's Word. Is this accurate? Yes. Did God mess up when He wrote this? No. Are you convinced of that? Yes. Okay, now that you've said that, you're accountable to what we read next. Okay? You can't plead ignorance on this one. Verse 22. Wives, oops, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. See now, right here, men, plug your ears. See, this is not written to you. This is written to the wives. Men, this is not you know, the, the word sharper than any two-edged sword, so you can take it and pierce your wife. This is God's word to her. So mind your own business. Okay? So, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to the husbands in everything. Now, We're not going to talk about that. Okay? Now that, that pretty much says it straight up. And wives, I know a lot of you, you're already going, I got the lame end of the deal. <laughs> Check out what God expects of men. Okay? Husbands, love your wives. What's the word love there? What's the Greek word? Anybody know? Anybody want to volunteer it? What? Agape. This is the same kind of love that God has for his people. Okay? Completely unconditional, without reservation. Not holding anything back. Okay, this isn't the brotherly love, phileo, or the, the love required of family, or, or, you know, even the erotic love. This, this is unconditional. Okay? God doesn't do things in half measures. Love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. See, husband... <laughs> We're given a, a tremendously high calling. We are given a, a calling that is compared to the highest calling of all, Christ giving himself for the church. Okay? Now, I, I addressed this a couple weeks ago. I'm going to hit it again. Men, you know, when it says um, that he gave his life, it wasn't just on the cross. Go back and reread the ministry of Jesus. Okay? Because he spends all night ministering and healing and teaching. All night. And then he gets up early in the morning to go up on the mountain for some alone time to pray. Look, there's nowhere in Scripture you're going to find me time. Okay? Get me out of the equation. Okay? Me time exists in God time. Spending time with God. You want to be refreshed? You want to be rejuvenated? Spend time with God. Okay, so Jesus sets himself apart, and he goes and he prays. The disciples get up, and they're like, all right, let's carry on with this whole miracle thing. Where'd he go? 
So off they go, up to the mountain. There's Jesus, getting refreshed. And they come up and they're like, hey! Come on, we got stuff we got to do. Does Jesus say, no, now it's me time? No. He says, you know what, you're right. Let's go, let's go on to the further village and I might teach there. That's what I've come to do. Over and over again, we see throughout Scripture that Jesus takes time away from himself to be able to minister. This is the kind of love husbands that we have for our wives. And by extension, for our children. See, everybody wants the quick death. Nobody wants the long, drawn-out, slow death. No greater love has any man but that he lay down his life for his friend. How much greater then would your love be for your wife? Okay, see, the marriage relationship is like the cancer of death. Because it's designed to kill you over a long period of time, to get you over yourself. You cannot have a successful marriage when it's all about you. That's wives, that's husbands. Now, I say this to encourage husbands. This is a high calling. But actually, I'm saying it for the wives and the children. So you understand the task that God has given your husband and your father. He has given them a task that is very, very hard. It's not easy. He's got to deal with all of you. You know? He's got to deal with you when you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. He's got to deal with you when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. But see, God doesn't just end it right there for fathers, for husbands. Okay, we've dealt with husbands and wives. Now, now, now let's talk specifically about fathers, because it is Father's Day. So kids, look at what, look, what your father does for you. And I'm saying kids of all ages. I'm not just referring to this little section right here, because we all have fathers, right? Most of them living. <coughs> but let's, let's check this out. Uh, Deuteronomy 6. Look over to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, it's on page 192. <laughs> you guys got the wrong Bible. <laughs> okay, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. I'm going to read this, this whole passage here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, first thing I want to point out here is it's speaking personally. It says, you shall love. They shall be on your heart. Okay? So, so, fathers, the first thing that we have to do is we have to apply this to us. Okay? we got to we got to have these things written in our heart. Okay? we got to know what this word says. Just like Steve encouraged us this morning with, with his testimony. we got to get into this. Uh, Jeannie, I'm, I'm going to share your story, Jeannie. Um, I, I was appalled. Uh, she did the, the funeral for her mother last week. Uh, actually, I guess it was two weeks ago. And in the process of sit, making the funeral arrangements, she was sitting in the, the, the office with the, the priest. It was a Catholic mass. And Jeannie wanted to go over some scriptures and ask if she could see his Bible. And there was no Bible to be found. And this is someone we're trusting to lead God's flock. Okay? But see, the onus is not here. I mean, yeah, there, there is burden on me to know God's Word, but, but there's burden on you as well. And so, the next part that I want you to see is it's not enough just to have it for yourself. Fathers, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Flip over, I'm, well, you don't need to flip. I'm just going to go over to Proverbs uh, chapter 22. 
in verse 6. Now, I, 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 we'll probably go into this a little bit more later, but I want you to understand there are direct promises given in God's Word, and there are principles established in God's Word. Okay? Now, the problem with that concept is that some people think it's a promise, and other people think it's a principle. Okay? I believe this passage that I'm going to read to you is a principle. Okay? I believe this to be a principle. Okay? And I'll tell you why after. 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. things at you frequently. Okay? I know for me it was. I had an older brother that had a 92 mile an hour fastball. And I got to be his catcher. And I could make myself really small behind that glove. And I did a lot of praying behind that glove. Okay? Muscle memory. How do you develop muscle memory? By doing things over and over and over and over and over and over again. That same application follows in this Bible. First to ourselves, reading it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Guys, there is so there are so many ways to read through this whole thing in a year. That it's ridiculous. Quite honestly, if you're not managing to read through the whole thing in a year, I sure hope it's because you're spending a lot of time in a particular area. Okay? Get through the whole thing. I, I say this as a condemnation to myself because for a long time there were books that I hated to read. I don't like Jeremiah. <laughs> Alright? I tend to have a depressive personality anyway. And I don't like all the doom and gloom in Jeremiah. But you know, I forced myself to read it. Okay? This year was the third time, the second time that I read through Jeremiah. And all of a sudden, I'm not seeing all the doom and gloom anymore. I see the condition that predicates that, but I see God's out. And I see, woven throughout this, this tapestry of doom and gloom, a golden thread of salvation. Okay? Take the opportunity, personally, read it first. Then we've got to share it with our kids. Uh, sometimes they don't listen so well. See, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from I believe it's a principle because you get that muscle memory in there. Okay? They're not saying in here that they're not going to do stupid things when they move out. They're going to do stupid things when they move out. Okay? You know, experience is still the best teacher. But if you give them the wherewithal to deal with the situation when they're experiencing it, Oh, yeah. I remember this. You know, there's a story in the Bible that deals with this. How did he do that? You give them the principles. You give them foundational tools whereby they can deal with their own stupidity. Okay? This is another task. Wives, children, these are what your dad's doing. These are the calling that your dad has. Now, I'm going to share with you one other area. I, I, I don't know why this is, guys. I really don't. But dads get a bum rap. It's absolutely amazing to me the number of people that I talk to, that I counsel with, and, and going back for years and years and years, just in fellowship. 
I, I'm guessing, just, just off the top of my head, I'm guessing, for every one that has a, a struggle and an issue and a, a, a hardship against their mother, there's four that have that same feeling toward their father. They get a bum rap. Now, fathers do stupid things because they're human, just like you. Just like you do stupid things, they did stupid things. But I would ask you, you know, Jesus, when he was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, by the measure you forgive, you will be forgiven. And I just want to encourage you today, if you have hardships to your father, do you want forgiveness for yourself? Do you long for forgiveness? And grant it. Give it. Give forgiveness. Look, I was going to do a, a demonstration, but my son walked out with a loaf of bread. <laughs> I'm not going to throw it this time. <laughs> Stick your arm straight out. Stick it out. Is that heavy? No, it's not heavy. How long do you suppose you can keep that out there? Not as long as you're going to want me to. <laughs> Dustin, Dustin's a strong young man. Give it to Dustin. Stick it out there, Dustin. Don't let it drop until I tell you. Okay? Now see, that box is unforgiveness. And we all, in some measure, hold on to unforgiveness. I, I'm still working through some things. And I, it's amazing to me because sometimes I feel like I've forgiven somebody. And years and years and years later, something pops up. And I go, oh, I need to go back and do this again. I need to work through this process again. See, the longer you hold on to it, the heavier it gets. Okay? The burden is on you. The scripture even tells us, if you bring your sacrifice to the altar and there realize that there is an offense against your brother, go and be reconciled to him. See, it puts the onus on you. All too often, we're eager to forget that they'll just come and ask. Well, I'm going to forgive that. They've got to come and ask me. As soon as they ask me, done. Done deal. See, that's not how it works. The burden is on you. It's always on you. Go and be reconciled. Let go of the burden. And, and you may have to let go of it a number of times. For whatever reason, we're stupid. We, oh, 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 man, that is fantastic. I can't believe how good I feel. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, oh, whoo. You guys really need to try out this forgiveness thing. <laughs> Put it back up. <laughs> <laughs> See, today's Father's Day. And fathers, I don't want you to feel like I've, I've laid a burden on you. As a matter of fact, for years and years, I refused to go to church on Father's Day. I, I refused. Because I got sick and tired of on the one day of the year that, that we are honoring the fathers, I would go to church and I'd get bashed. Fathers, you're not doing a good enough job! We need you praying more. We need you read the Bible more. We need you being better fathers, husbands, and just all around men. Yeah. Gosh, that makes me feel so honored. <laughs> you know? And actually, it was a, a, about four or five years ago that um, uh, Trevor actually got up and, and actually had some words of condemnation because on Father's Day that year, um, I, I think he said we had seven fathers in church. <clears throat> Because, see, fathers don't want to be in church on Father's Day. And that, that convicted my heart because his, his, his question was, what does that tell your children? See, we're, we're called to train them, to instruct them, to be diligent about that. And, and I was convicted because here I am telling my kids that on Father's Day it's okay to stay home from church so we don't need fellowship. Okay? So, fathers, I don't want you to feel like I'm chastising you today. I only lay those things out so that wives and children can understand what it means to be a dad. See, if you're not honoring your dad, you look at the job that God has given them, the example that he set, the measure to which he holds them. 
I want to reread that last line here. Instead of complaining about what husbands and fathers don't do, let's honor them for what they do do. Oh dear. Your arm was starting to go like this. 